good to go almost. Um, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, we have taken the time to join us today uh, in this uh, Global Hand Washing Day special webinar, uh, aptly titled uh, Hygiene and Behavioral Shifts, What Have We Learned? Uh, hopefully lots and uh, we would be looking forward to uh, listen in uh, from our esteemed uh, group of panelists that we have today uh, with us and hopefully learn about the sort of collective wisdom about uh, hand washing hygiene practices uh, in uh, relation to COVID-19 and beyond that as well. I am Raki Povi uh, from BRAC and I'll be your host uh, this afternoon uh, for this webinar. So thank you all for joining us, uh, including our speakers and all the participants whom I've been told are uh, joining from different uh, time zones across the world. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Now, um, a bit about the webinar itself before I go on to introduce our uh, speakers and then move on to the uh, sort of main conversation in here today. So hand washing uh, has been established as, as, a, as a very effective tool uh, of, of hygiene uh, to uh, sort of fight off uh, viral infections and different types of diseases. Uh, it has been proven uh, with research after research that uh, if uh, people are washing their hands, not only they would be in better health, but also it has a direct linkage with uh, the uh, economy of a household uh, in regards to how household members can stay productive because they're not uh, uh, remaining ill uh, for preventable diseases. Even then, uh, we have seen in rural Bangladesh that a staggeringly low number of, of population uh, uses soap to wash their hand, which is a, a, a proven way of fighting off uh, viral diseases. And uh, I think during this uh, global pandemic that we are experiencing right now, uh, it has been emphasized and re-emphasized that how hand washing uh, can be an effective tool uh, to fight off the spread of this virus and help everyone around us keep safe in addition to uh, physical distancing and wearing masks. Now, in light of everything, um, BRAC has been quite active in uh, responding to COVID-19 uh, in Bangladesh and in all the other 11 countries that we present in. Uh, beyond that as well, we have had uh, water sanitation and hygiene related programming running for uh, uh, a long time uh, over the last two decades or so. Uh, to, to sharpen our work and to strengthen our work, uh, we have also been supported by the Hygiene and Behavior Change Coalition, uh, which is supporting this webinar uh, today. Uh, it's a coalition of like-minded partners uh, supported by the UK government's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and Unilever, where uh, we are looking to uh, sort of nudge uh, members of the communities to adopt long-term sustainable hand hygiene behaviors. And we are also looking to uh, uh, sort of establish hand washing stations across the country in Bangladesh to ensure that people uh, have uh, access to hand washing stations uh, in convenient locations. And we are also working in uh, behaviorally informed communication campaigns designs to uh, influence uh, 10 million people in Bangladesh over a course of a year uh, for better and sustained hand hygiene behaviors. Now, moving on from that, uh, our, our, one of the core objectives of, of uh, this work that we are doing with Hygiene and Behavior Change Coalition is to generate evidence for what really works uh, in changing people's behaviors for the better as long as hand hygiene and uh, hand washing is related. Um, and uh, that is a great segue to today's uh, webinar's theme that what are we learning from on the ground practices, implementations, and different types of research activities that we are running um, uh, for, for a long time. So uh, to that end, we have today with us an incredibly uh, diverse uh, panel of speakers who would be uh, sharing their own knowledge and uh, learnings from their work on the ground, working with communities, uh, the groundbreaking research that they have been doing. We have representatives from uh, the development sector, uh, the research uh, uh, sectors, academics, and also uh, private sector and uh, the government. 
So without further ado, I'd like to quickly uh, introduce uh, our speakers uh, from uh, today to uh, all of our audience in here. So we have with us uh, Dr. Muhammad Akramul Islam, who is the Director of uh, Communicable Diseases and Water Sanitation and Hygiene uh, Program at BRAC. And Dr. Islam is, the, uh, is also an adjunct professor at James Bray Grant School of Public Health at BRAC University and has years of experience in uh, delivering public health uh, projects uh, in, in the field of WASH and communicable diseases. We have with us uh, Mr. Ehda Shamul Rasul Khan, who is the project director of WASH uh, under Department of Public Health Engineering, uh, represent, representing the voice of the government in this conversation. Um, Mr. Khan is currently overseeing the UNICEF WASH project as the spokesperson of the government of Bangladesh. Um, we have with us uh, Ms. Haseen Jahan, uh, Country Director of Water Aid Bangladesh. Uh, Ms. Jahan has, uh, is, has been working in the development sector with decades of experience in water sanitation and hygiene. And she's recognized as an influential uh, WASH leader who promotes gender equality and youth empowerment. Has been known to experiment with innovative solutions uh, affecting the communities uh, for the good. Next, uh, we have Dr. Imran Mateen, who is the Executive Director of BRAC Institute of Governance and Development. Um, Dr. Mateen provides strategic direction and oversees strategy implementation for advancing BIGD, BIGD's mission. And BIGD has been quite active uh, uh, from the onset of COVID-19 in uh, answering some of the core questions regarding uh, how COVID-19 is affecting uh, people living in poverty from different uh, dimensions. And they're also a core partner uh, to BRAC in the Hygiene and Behavior Change Coalition Initiative. Um, next, we have uh, with us uh, Ms. Shamima Akhtar, Head of Corporate Affairs, Partnerships and Communications uh, from Unilever. Uh, Ms. Akhtar uh, leads our Unilever Bangladesh sustainability-related operations and has been a great supporter of BRAC over the years. Uh, she previously was uh, with Coca-Cola Bangladesh and has uh, uh, a career spanning decades with uh, uh, spending in the nexus of private sector de and development. Next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Stuart Kettle, a principal advisor of Behavioral Insights team. Uh, Stuart uh, is co-leading uh, BIT, uh, Behavioral Insights team, international programs from the London office. And his work has focused on the application of behavioral insights to public policy uh, with international organizations and foreign governments. BIT is also uh, one of the more valued partners uh, of the HBCC coalition uh, uh, is, is working with BRAC in understanding what sort of behaviors uh, could, uh, could, could be long lasting in terms of promoting hand washing. Now, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, some housekeeping rules for the session and how it's structured, uh, we have divided up the webinar into three different uh, uh, sort of uh, segments. And each segment, I'll be bringing in uh, speakers from a certain sector. And after they have uh, sort of uh, finished their uh, part, uh, we will moving, uh, we'll be moving on to uh, 10 minutes Q&A where uh, members of the audience can uh, post questions, uh, uh, post questions in the chat box, and I'll, I'll bring along the questions and uh, have a dialogue with the speakers. And then we'll move on to the next section. So three different sections and uh, audience will have uh, uh, the opportunity to ask questions in the chat box and we'll be keeping a close tab on that. So uh, without further ado, let me move to the first section of today's webinar. Uh, uh, I'd like to start with Dr. Akram uh, in here today. Uh, uh, Akram Bhai, you have been uh, quite instrumental in scaling up BRAC's wash related operations. And uh, at one point, uh, BRAC's wash operations was covering uh, almost half of the country with a large set of interventions. Uh, what have we learned over the years of uh, trying to implement and take these hygiene related messages to communities? And what would you say uh, our, our approach has changed uh, during COVID-19? So uh, my question would be more towards that. What has been your experience in um, implementing large scale programs on the ground? And what are the differences that you're seeing uh, during COVID-19? Uh, Dr. Akram. 
thank you abhi yeah. so i think i will touch first on the our experiences uh, uh, one issue that uh, that came out you know in, in, as you said that we we have been working on the wash sectors quite a long time and the wash program was more intensified in 2000 from since 2006 Uh, and, and they're mostly focused on A- MDG targets, uh, and then also we are also involved in uh, raising the SDG targets, uh, working the uh, wash field and covering almost you know the large numbers of opposelas where we are working there. The few experience we have, it you know, while we uh, were implementing the wash program, uh, we tried to basically uh, mobilize our entire workforce uh, to. Im- promote the hygiene behavior in the, as a, the center of this inter uh, wash intervention so uh, to promoting the wash behavior and practices basically we we took uh, a kind of a, a structure in every village so first we created the village wash committee where uh, half of the members are women half of the men so it's, it comes from uh, from the from the from the villages so we created a platform in the villages as a wash committee the second part what we what we did it also we also recruited the 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 program assistant or all the workers from the same communities from the same community so it's uh, at least for the one to two workers for union so so they can speak with their own languages they know each other very well you know and then third one we also think that uh, because since it, this is being all village by the process then we also think about that why don't we work also with the schools for the future generation so it's basically a three prong way that we move on that way well the wash committees in every villages uh, well, we give them orientation and training both on leadership as well as you know the technical know how of the wash facilities improvements as well as the behavior change as a, as a center of this whole interventions as i talked about it uh, it was including the hand washing and then uh, safe use of uh sanitations also at the hand washing was was a key part of that the second part of, well uh, our workers being recruited for the local community they were been moving around every household in this locality and so they do a courtyard meetings and also, also individual households reaching the women's and the adolescents giving this hygiene education including the menstrual hygiene and hand washing together you know and also the improve the sanitation coverage in the villages so it's kind of a holistic approach we did it but we engage more on the engaging people in this in the in this uh, locality so that they can understand their own problems they can you know the you know the own the issues by themselves so that they can change their own behaviors uh, which has a uh, quite a sustainable impact in in terms of human capital development and also the sustainable behavior change so that they can carry out with their whole generation and the next similar to the education uh, sectors we have been covering a huge number of schools around currently we are on uh, around close to 6 6700 high schools uh, we've been uh, promoting the wash uh, practices both and uh, you know separate latrines for the boys and girls you know hand washing stations you know safe drinking water uh, and also this ministerial hygiene practices so while we're doing it in these schools we also thought that uh, it's not only the infrastructure improvement but you really need to engage the students to understand why this is being needed so we create a capacity of every classes so we 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 created a capacity every classes so that the class they will be leaders and we give them training to this young kids uh, why they will uh, wash the hands uh, how they will maintain the own latrines and, and facilities and also we to train the teachers in the school so that they can you know they can maintain their do the maintenance of the facilities as well as also the uh, promote the you know healthy behaviors within the schools that's what the kind of a big way of Uh, looking for the future generation not the current generation so we thought maybe children could also it's it is very interesting you know children can bring these ideas to the home so they they just improve their own practices at the home you know they they improve the whole hygiene behaviors and sanitation practice at the home but also they are being the future parents and leaders in the society so they will be carrying this generation to generation which is more sustainable so this is the way that we really work in the larger scale as you say there more than 250 upazilas who have been working from there you know nearly 6000 schools so it's quite a large scale of impact and uh, after doing that we made a small survey by our research and evaluation division in in, in the latter part of you know around two, you know 2012 13 and we 
clearly showed that this dramatically decrease of the diarrheal diseases happen, you know, over the couple of years. If you do the really good wash interventions with safe order, proper sanitation and hand washing, that's the kind of a give up testimony that it really impact happen on the diseases. That's what we always talked about this. If you have your uh, safe uh, hygiene practices, good hand washings, basically the infectious diseases, Communicable disease will be reduced, reduced further more. What about diseases? Diseases reduce further more. And that's really a good testimony that we have it in inside. So these are good lessons that, but what another important lessons we have it when we're doing it household level interventions, we found that one of the big groups basically we're missing, that's the male group, you know, they're not at the home. Uh, because we're teaching the girls and women and then we're teaching their schools, but that there are many uh, society you understand very well that men are more decision making for building their own uh, latrines, you know, sanitation improvement, and then buying the soil materials for hand washing other devices. Then we basically starts a large scale mill, you know, uh, kind of a campaign through the religious forums, you know, religious institutions, you know, and then also this, uh, the marketplaces, you know, the TS tells and other places. So we, we, we really risk uh, numbers of uh, millions of uh, uh, mills also so for that. Right. The influence of the decision yeah. making. So that's yeah. one of the lessons that we have. It thank kind you. Of a, a thank you for that. Thank you for that, Akram Bhai. And yeah. uh, we'll, we'll get to you later uh, during the Q and A session. So it's 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 uh, great to hear about the community based approach that Brack has taken, and uh, the way you mentioned that also involving the next generation, um, not just thinking about the current generation uh, uh, in in terms of bringing lasting change. So with that, uh, I think I would I would want to move towards uh, Haseen Appa, who has also run large-scale programs uh, in, in her career. But my question would be more towards, uh, due to COVID-19, we have seen a lot of changes now. Uh, everyone is calling this the new normal. And uh, for digital interventions, uh, digital delivery mechanisms, so what does it mean for next generation of uh, WASH practitioners? How do we reach out to people? How do we keep uh, ensuring long-lasting uh, sort of uh, change in terms of uh, hygiene behaviors. So that's one guiding question for you. Thank you, Asina. Uh, if you Thank please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, just to take cue from Akram Bhai, what he mentioned uh, about hygiene practice and hygiene promotion strategy. When uh, in Bangladesh. Everybody knows uh, the F diagram, the very typical fecal oral disease transmission route. Everybody knows uh, who are in working in development sector. So our hygiene function session starts with that diagram to ignite the community. But due to COVID, that whole notion is there. We started people to ignite, to let them understand that every disease starts with Fecal contamination, but now things have totally changed. And hygiene became right now a top priority being the first line of defense against COVID-19. And hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene became new buzzwords. Hy uh, now a days, boundary of hygiene should be redefined. And respiratory hygiene and maintenance must be an integral part of WASH programming right now. Right now. Process and timing of hand washing will be equally important. And now our messaging are quite different. And if you minutely observe, we are talking about the process, how to wash hands. We are uh, communicating the entire process to the target audience, as well as the timing at least 20 seconds. So these are really important. But what additionally we need to communicate to the people is the timing as well as the less use of water. So how to reduce wastage of water, that should be coming in the next programming. We should think that as well. Now coming to the critical time. Earlier there were five critical times. Of, two, of those five, there were two critical times. One is after defecation and before eating. And there are three more critical times. Like after cleaning child feces, something like that. Now, there will be more critical times to be added, like after entering at household premises or after entering to office, institutions, school, or whatever. After touching any metallic surface, before wearing any mask, or after 
uncovering the mask, something like that. So this sort of, you know, new messages and new critical times should be incorporated in our hygiene messages, and this should be followed from now on. And already uh, Akram Bhai mentioned about the focused target audience, and he mentioned about school students and mothers who are our primary target audience earlier. But now those are remain uh, those are remain important, but together with them, we are also targeting men and boys equally who are equally important, but we cannot ignore aged people, people having comorbid symptoms and people having disabilities. So they will get equal attention. These, they are equally important and we can do this for them. And apart from households and schools, we have to think that hygiene promotion to marketplaces, bus terminals, bus stations, train stations, public places, and where not. Even in, in the public transport, we should bring those places under hygiene promotion coverage. And we should tailor our generic messages as, as well, broadening our hygiene promotion boundary. Like all soaps are equally good, irrespective of brand. We should also promote that not only wash, had, washing hands with soap and water is important. Where wash, uh, wherever water is not available and soap is not available, people should use hand sanitizer. That sort of message should also come. And we also should design our communication materials in such a way that we should not always show that running water uh, for washing hands. We should also show how captured water is used to wash hands because that is the reality. And most important, regeneration of waste is also important and how we are managing that, that should also come under WASH programming. And finally, I would say one important thing that we should have long-term vision in designing our WASH program in coming future. And why people actually wash hands? There are a few reasons. One is knowledge. People should have understanding that the importance of hand washing and necessity for that, that's number one. The second is enabling environment. That means that people have available water, soap, and the infrastructure, I mean, hand washing facilities. So we have to make those available. And finally, the most important thing that we have to make it a social norm. Unless we can make it a social norm, it will not be a part of our habit. So let us make it a social norm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sinapa. And uh, I think very relevant point regarding uh, changing the paradigm of uh, our messaging, uh, changing the way we deliver our messages, focusing on different types of products and a lot more focus on processes to, uh, I think, inculcate the behaviors of right way of washing hands. So uh, all, all very great points. I would uh, actually now want to move to uh, uh, Dr. Imran Mateen. Uh, Imran Pai, BIGD has been involved in different types of uh, sort of research initiatives from the onset of COVID-19 and before that as well. So it's, it's safe to assume that uh, you and your researchers would have a lot of understanding regarding some of these barriers that people um, face uh, when, uh, when sort of adopting long lasting behaviors regarding hand hygiene. Maybe if you could talk a little about that and your overall experience uh, during this pandemic. Great. Uh, yeah, Thank thanks you. a lot. Can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear I me? can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Avi. Um, uh, so, I mean, if you, I mean, right at the outset, I think, uh, uh, I think it, uh, uh, you know, it's important to sort of uh, highlight, and this everybody knows, but still important that um, uh, uh, the notion of germ theory is quite difficult to uh, make into a popular way of thinking about uh, hygiene uh, in, 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 in many, many uh, societies and particularly in, 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 in South Asia and, and, in, and in Bangladesh. And, and I think this remains to be an underlying challenge. The world of invisible uh, is a very difficult concept uh, to be able to uh, uh, sort of deal with. And this remains to be an underlying uh, kind of, uh, I think, challenge. Of course, it has evolved over time. You know, I think many years of work that Akram Bhai and Asinapa uh, just mentioned 
I think uh, you know has kind of uh, nibbled away at that at that at that at that problem. But I think that problem still remains. It sort of is very very important. Um, uh, so, so I think it's really important that we, you know, kind of whatever, uh, uh, you know, we sort of think about uh, in terms of uh, in terms of hygiene behavior change in the COVID context as well. We keep that underlying constraint in mind, um, uh, and 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 think how to basically sort of address that. Um, and the second is, uh, you know, disease prevention generally is not found to be a very good motivator for people to actually, you know, kind of change uh, behavior in a sort of sustained way. Um, so, that, so, so those are the two kind of underlying, I think, uh, constraints. I think uh, that means conceptual constraints uh, that we need to keep in mind. However, I think in case of COVID, uh, something new has happened. I think because of, uh, there's this whole notion uh, uh, because of the deaths and, uh, and, uh, and the sort of uh, big, big uh, fear around uh, around death, and I think the term that is used uh, that we found in the qualitative studies that we have done is the idea of kumora and shumora, a good death and a bad death. The idea that if you die, uh, you know, your relatives can't sort of bury you, can't come close to you, that is seen as a bad death. And I think that whole uh, uh, fear has been really important in terms of, uh, you know, people adopting uh, 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 you know this, uh, this, this uh, hand washing practices uh, uh, much more uh, robustly than I think they would otherwise have had if this was a other type of infection without that kind of a threat. And I think that's really really important because I think uh, I think I think I think that basically shapes some of the uh, challenges that we, we may we may see as the narrative shifts from. A, uh, a kind of a much more of an austere narrative to a more, more relaxed narrative that we are increasingly seeing. And, and I think it's sort of important we basically keep that in mind and that may have an, a, a, a kind of a risk and a, and a, and a possible, uh, you know, kind of, a, I wouldn't say reversal, but the accelerated progress that was made in the initial few months in terms of people's hand washing behavior may actually take a back seat because the narrative is changing uh, and I think the importance of hand washing, and again, people are seeing that this not being that aligned. On the one hand, you have a much more of a relaxed narrative that is emerging. And on the other hand, you know, there's still this talk about hand washing and it's very difficult. Uh, so I think it's, it's sort of important that uh, uh, from a narrative construction point of view, uh, we, we, we also uh, pay attention to that in terms of constraint. Um, just a few other thoughts and I'll just, uh, I'll stop. Uh, so in our research, we, we found a few, 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 I mean, we did two pieces of qualitative work with respect to HBCC. One is uh, we did this, uh, you know, what is, what is called a user's, uh, you know, we looked at user's perspective, and then we did a water station, uh, hand washing station process uh, evaluation. I'll draw from both of this a bit in terms of thinking about barriers. So, so the first thing about, about barriers is that in the knowledge domain, there seems to be you know, kind of three different types of, uh, 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 you know, kind of categories here. So one is correct knowledge, one is, you know, kind of partially correct knowledge, and one is incorrect knowledge. And I think it's important that we devise strategies to address each of these a bit differently, uh, uh, rather than in a, you know, in sort of one, with a homogeneous way. So there is correct knowledge with respect to the importance of hand washing. I think people understand it. And I think that the COVID threat and fear did play a role and, you know, just keep what I said initially in mind that there may be a back, back a sliding potential there. We need to keep in mind, but I think there's generally correct knowledge with respect to hand washing practices. The mixed knowledge really is around things like, you know, one should be washing hand outside when it goes outside, but not one is when one is inside the house, for instance, right? Uh, uh, so there's mixed, there's, so that's like a mixed knowledge. And what is inside is also very culturally constructed. Right for a slum dweller, what is inside is is his or her mahalla, right? It's not the notion of a household, right? So and for for uh, for uh, in the village, it may be you know his body, his or her body, or maybe even the even the para. So I think this notion of locality and what is a what is a local, you know, what is inside and what's outside is become so important. What is safe and not not safe? So I think so that's a mixed domain in terms of category in terms of thinking about knowledge. And there are some which are, you know, incorrect, which are, you know, I, I, you know, believe that, you know, if you do, if you do Oju, 
uh, you know, you don't, you don't really need to, uh, you know, kind of uh, do your hand washing because you are washing your hands so many times and yet there's no use of soap there. Uh, so I think, but there are some innovative practices there. And I think it's important that we uh, also think about not only the water stations, which is a good intervention generally, but I think also how do we scale this through existing infrastructure and behavior that people have. And I think the mosque congregation is a big one and finding, uh, you know, kind of ways to sort of uh, get soap usage increased and accessible in the, in the, in the, in the, in the abolition uh, uh, water points, I think, I think would be a good thing to basically think about, right? So uh, the final point I want to make, uh, final two points, one is around gender and one is around governance. It was really uh, interesting what Akram Bhai and Hasina also said about, you know, I, I totally forgot actually that, uh, that there were so many years of wash household-based wash work which targeted women. It will be a fascinating, uh, uh, I think, research to really, uh, uh, to sort of look at what has been the impact of that long investment of wash at the household level through women in terms of us preparing uh, or responding in terms of quite good practices at the household level uh, with hand washing uh, uh, that, that helped us during COVID. And I think this would be maybe, you know, a, a, a really interesting uh, work to do because I think that many years of work at the household level with women has been really, really important. But I think in, 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 in the current interventions, I mean, there still are women traders. There are women who come into the marketplace. The mobility of women are growing. And many of this water uh, uh, station that, uh, that BRAC has basically uh, kind of uh, set up. One problem there is to pay a bit more attention to, uh, to sort of gender dimension. I mean, I think some of the design features uh, are, 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 are not as gender appropriate. And there are things like, you know, uh, hand washing, by the way, is a very private affair. Uh, it is a very gendered affair. I mean, you know, for men to wash with soap and foam and, you know, publicly for women, it is actually not, uh, you know, it can be quite constraining. So I think we need to keep some of these things in mind. Some of the uh, uh, design features in terms of when you push the pedal down, uh, somebody wearing a sari or a, or a, or a burqa or a, or a shalwar kameez, uh, you know, it sort of lifts up your, your sari and that does make the woman uncomfortable. So I think it's sort of important from a uh, practical gender point of view to look at these issues. However, we also need to work on the strategic gender point of view as well to see how we can, you know, kind of change these norms as well. So I think, I think there is an important gender dimension that we need to think about as we go, uh, 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 you know, kind of designing this intervention. Finally, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Imran Bhai. No, we'll, <laughs> no we'll, I'm sure we'll have, we'll have time during the Q&A session to bring in the governance aspect. Right. But fascinating, fascinating insights yeah. regarding the uh, gender perspective uh, in, in, in sort of uh, uh, unearthing evidence regarding hand washing and how there are different types of knowledges. Sometimes uh, partial knowledge uh, is, is there and sometimes there's a total absence. So all fascinating uh, points. But since we have a bit of time uh, to take questions from the audience, I'm seeing people are posting questions, uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd maybe start with uh, Hasina Ba regarding, uh, uh, you know, how you see, uh, you talked a lot about uh, the change in process, the change in uh, the type of messaging uh, that uh, we should do uh, in this in this new context, but uh, people who are now designing different types of interventions, uh, what would be your uh, advice towards them on how to deliver these messages? Uh, because uh, due to COVID nineteen, there is uh, we are seeing a shortcoming in in person sort of. Uh, orientation or delivery of messages. So what would be your advice towards people who are now designing interventions? How to reach okay. people best? In designing messages, you mean? Uh, designing messages and interventions in general in okay. WASH sector. So in case of designing messages, I, I will strongly um, critic uh, because uh, at country level, we don't find any um, consistency in messages in not target audience specific messages. If you look at our TV and uh, um, general, I mean, uh, social media, most of the messages you are seeing that, that there is running water and people are washing their hands. But if you look at the statistics, only 15% people in the whole country are having access to running water. That means we are giving 
messages to the 15 only 15 percent audience people right audience so we have to think that how we are generalizing the messages how we are giving the messages for the rural community how we are giving the messages for the people who are living in chittagong hill tracks or in the howard area so we have to prepare the messages contextualizing the country situation that's number one the second point um, there are people who are having uh, some sort of disabilities so for the, for them we need to develop tailored message we have to um, make the message friendly for them that is not we don't see that sort of message I mean, much more friendly for disabled people so that is another concern now coming back to the point of uh, disabled friendly uh, facilities. Most of the facilities are not disabled friendly. We tried, we tried to uh, uh, develop a range of uh, hand washing devices. We actually developed 22 types of hand washing facilities and developed a manual, which we try to disseminate as much as possible. It is online. So anybody can pick and try to adopt based on their context. Uh, and we have wanted to make it public so that that can come benefit to other people. So when we design the public facility, so we have to look at uh, that that is um, paddle operated. So every, it is not touched by hand. So so that people uh, it is more safe. That is number one. The second point is when you design this type of uh, infrastructure, those are likely to be I mean, uh, damaged very, very frequently. So you have to plan for troubleshooting as well. So you need to plan the operation maintenance when you are designing the infrastructure. And then that means that you need to have your operation and maintenance plan as long as you are designing and implementing the infrastructure. So let me stop here. Uh, so I can give more tips if somebody have any specific questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Very, very useful and very specific in, in terms of uh, how intervention should be designed and uh, not just messages, but also the delivery of it, starting from uh, uh, not making it mandatory for people to use their hands to operate these devices. Very, very relevant. Um, I have an uh, audience question, which I think could be relevant for Akram Pai in here. So, uh, so the question is for a community-based hand washing program, how do you plan to create community ambassadors? Uh, or if you already have that program, what do you teach them to approach local people and families from their village? Could this be replicated in other areas such as uh, for menstrual hygiene teaching uh, as well? And how do you include those who are intersex people and people with disabilities? So I think, I think the question covers a lot of ground regarding uh, how do you sort of take this knowledge and lesson of uh, involving these community volunteers to solve other problems as well. And how do you be more inclusive? So question for Akram Bhai. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm, before going uh, to uh, you know, respond on that, I think I need to touch on the two issues. One is we really need to uh, promote uh, a sustainable uh, behavior change. Like this, we really need, really need to promote that proper hand washing behavior in the sustained manner, you know, uh, in an emergency, you know, this, this behavior change happen more on an emergency basis. And that's what uh, we experience in the COVID situation, you know, the people uh, dramatically increase the hand washing, mask use, you know, and then when there is a, you know, reduction of the diseases, people also being relaxed, you know, this is really happens is, is if, if you look into this Ebola experience, very similar experiences. So I think that's, uh, it's not a bad, but this is really the reality and the people's behavior. So we really need to work together or, or kind of a proper hand washing or proper hygiene behaviors. I will say hygiene behavior in general, uh, hand washing perhaps the one, the respiratory hygiene perhaps another one while we're using masks for the, any, any kind of respiratory problems or common colds and environmental hygiene, which really makes it not to be crowded in one place. So when you look at the entire hygiene practices, which basically covers what we're saying now, 
and thus for the very risk factors for any infectious disease and communicable diseases. I think we need to promote that more sustainable way so that we can we can continue in the in the long term. Uh, apart from our emergency, uh, you know, messages, emergency knowledge, and emergency practices. Uh, going back to the, there are many chat questions here, so I will just ask. As for schools, I give an example. In the schools, we we call this student brigade, like. Uh, every class has two or three people. Basically, we train them on the on the hygiene, on, on the sanitation behavior you know, issues, or to make them the champion, you know, in the classes, so that they can you know, transfer this message to the fellow fellow friends, and then also bring to the house. I think that is one of the key uh, learnings that we can we can create very similar level of you know leaders in the every single community, like our community health volunteers, so they can also be engaged. You know, very similarly, we also did for the girls. For the ministerial hygiene in the schools, so I think this is really a kind of good examples uh, when uh, the boys and girls are being, you know, uh, working in their schools, you know, supporting their friends and colleagues or their friends there. I think that we can bring out the second part. What I was also looking in the chat box that uh, what is really a kind of a behavior of the people, as I said, was it possible for hand washing sustainable or not? Uh, I, as I said, is is what we promote for last six months is quite an emergency basis, you know, uh, building thousands of, you know, hand washing stations because there's no wait for us, you know, uh, there's no wait for a concrete or correct message. If there is a message, whatever we have it, we know it, we delivered it because there is a one day delay might have a causes for the several deaths. So I think that is really did work well, but the question now comes, uh, how do we maintain this hand washing stations that we developed in the emergency period, thousands, you know, I think there need to be another couple of years to be maintained for that. And and there we basically need to create a community ownership, institutional ownership. So we really linked these stations with the local communities, as Imran Bai was saying, and also Hasina Bai was saying, we really need to bring, connect these facilities with these uh, local leaders and then make it functional, uh, uh, keep the functional for another year so that uh, we could address the, uh, those way. Another part, uh, basically, you have, we have, you know, the wash interventions in the ground in the past, hygiene promotion by hand washing, and we'll continue to do it in, in, the, in the next couple, next few years at least. Uh, we plan for the continue our uh, school wash program, and uh, we are planning also being uh, hygiene practice promotion and facility improvement, facility improvement uh, before the school is opening. So that is one of the areas that we are thinking for. What we invested together with Unilever and, and, and other partners, we really like to continue it beyond the project periods. So we're also thinking for having a conversation on that uh, to make a very, very much sustainable way so that the community leadership can come forward and take the some ownership uh, with, with a lighter model that we can think in the future. So I think uh, yeah, if we can build the community ownership, I think it's possible to bring this, uh, uh, it's possible to sustain this, the, the practice that we started. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Akram Bhai. Um, Imran Bhai, I, want, I know that you wanted to touch upon the governance aspect of it. And uh, I think that's, that's a, a fascinating um, uh, sort of uh, lens to look at this overall uh, hand hygiene behavior change issue. So maybe if you want to talk a little about that governance aspect uh, that you yeah. wanted to talk about. Very, very quickly. I mean, I think yeah. Akram has already started mentioning and it is, uh, you know, uh, so, so, the, so I mean, so the main thing here is that, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is possible to have a short-term uh, effect in terms of having large number of people actually hand washing, but having absolutely uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of no effect in terms of uh, the sort of long-term outcomes. And it's, it's absolutely possible. Uh, so I think the, the way we need to be careful is that where we place the hand washing stations is really, really important. Uh, 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 and then, and then, and then, you know, it is, it is uh, because it is, it is it, it, these type of hand washing stations can become, you know, kind of a semi-private club good type of a thing, right? I mean, there are lots of hidden barriers that we need to keep in mind in terms of who can access it, not access it, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, there was a very interesting paper by Mushfiq Mubarak, which was done in the context of arsenic, uh, deep deep tube well, uh, uh, deep tube well insulation in 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 Bangladesh, where you know. You know, we have done fantastic in terms of number of deep tube well, uh, you know, installed. But if you look at whether that is an, that will have an effect in terms of safe water usage, it will not, because those deep deep tube well water placements have been absolutely politically driven. So I think it's really, really important that we keep the governance uh, aspects in mind if you really want to have the longer term effects here. 
Right, thank you. Thank you so much for pointing out, pointing this out. And of course, uh, oftentimes, I mean, when we are uh, thinking about uh, development in a single dimension, uh, sort of with a single dimension view, it's often easy to overlook uh, the issues around governance and how decisions are being made uh, regarding allocation of resources. So, uh, uh, of course, I think practitioners gathered in here today will take note of how to also be mindful of these often overlooked issues, which could uh, derail the success, uh, seeming success of, uh, of large scale initiatives. Now, so moving on from this part of the conversation, um, I would want to uh, 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 ask Stuart from Behavioral Insights team to the next phase. Um, how do you see uh, the impact of behaviorally informed interventions to make these behaviors stick or make uh, these, these projects more successful? Uh, what are the roles of it? And oftentimes we also hear, we also hear criticism from people of uh, this approach that we are just applying band-aid solutions to larger problems. So I think would be interested uh, to hear uh, from you, Stuart, on, on that aspect. Over to you. Great question. Thanks very much, Abby. Um, so, so I think the first thing to say is these, these, these things aren't very easy, right? The, the fact that we're having, um, you know, all the conversations that we have and all the insights that um, all, all of the speakers have said so far, um, it, it kind of points towards the fact that we need to think very kind of deeply. We need to you know, use the theory uh, that we have. Um, Imran Bai was kind of talking about germ theory and things like that. We need to bring those things in. We need to bring in all of the experience of, um, you know, years of programming from, from 2006 or, or, or um, you know, we've had lots of talk of um, the, the experience that is built up over all of that time. Um, but we're in a new situation. We're in a, um, we're in a pandemic, everything has kind of changed, both in the environment, both in the incentives that, that people have um, in order to act in certain ways. And so I think a key point is that we, we aren't going to know what works beforehand. What we have to do is, is build a kind of programmatic and project model that takes in all of these insights, that takes in this theory, that takes in, um, I guess, other theory from behavioral sciences and, of what drives people to, to change their behavior. And we've got to use that, all of those things combined in order to, to um, design interventions. Um, but then I think a key point is that we have to be a little bit humble in knowing what is going to work in, in this situation. And I think this is maybe an extreme case in terms of um, behavioral change and, and designing interventions in terms of the, the situation right now is, is so different from others. We both have changes to, to how people are thinking, but we also have, we have to act differently. We have to program differently. We can't do as many things face to face. We need to use different mechanisms things as well. And so what we need to do, uh, and I guess what the, the, the programming that we've been designing together um, over the last months has been doing is, is trying to, to take all of that theory I'm trying to understand the changes that are going on um, at the moment using kind of further research and using phone interviews and, and, and using observation on the ground in order to, to, to design interventions that we think will be the most effective and have a good chance. Um, but the key thing then is, and, and um, Imran Bai went into um, some of the, the techniques that we've been using over the previous months, but the key thing then is, is to use different uh, techniques and research techniques to test out um, those those kind of uh, ideas and interventions that we think will be effective but to iterate and to prototype and to, to pilot to see what works um, and I think that that's essentially uh, some, some of the activities that, that we've been doing over the previous months um, we, we rolled out uh, pilot evaluations of the, the hand washing stations we had um, observers um, watching the, the hand washing stations giving us kind of feedback on you know uh, who was using them how many people were using them um we we kind of saw some of those things that uh, have previously been talked about but overall the usage of the hand washing stations was was only 13 percent uh, of those users were women um and so getting that that, that data back and that and incorporating that into future designs is, is really important likewise we saw that um uh, the, the pedals were, were too high, 
um, difficult to use, and, and then that led to changes in um, the, how those were designed. Uh, and then likewise, we, we're even kind of prototyping with the, the data collection methods that we'll be using um, for, for future rollout as well. So we, the, the WASH team was prototyping with, with clickers that can record how many people are uh, using the stations that we'll then be able to use um, as the more stations are, are kind of rolled out. But even within that, we were prototyping the design of the clickers, which have then been changed um, so that they don't wear out and, and, and stop working. But the essential component, I guess, with all of those is that we have to kind of pilot different things to understand what is working. We need to get data back and then we need to kind of feed that into future designs. Uh, and I think going back a bit to your point around uh, long term change and long term outcomes is, is going to be a really key part of this component. Again, um, as lots of those things that um, Akram Bai was mentioning around um, community engagement uh, and the importance of, of ownership and things like that, they're all, they're all going to be very fundamentally important for those designs um, for the long term. And we need to, to make sure that we are kind of incorporating those into the programming. But again, it, it will hopefully be trying out, you know, different processes of, of what is the most effective way of doing that. And of course, we're, this is a very diff difficult circumstance. We're trying to do these things at, at 100 miles an hour and we're trying to, to build these stations very quickly. But what are, what are going to be the best ways of getting that engagement going when programming is, is so different and we can do less in face to face? And likewise, we'll have to, to try out different methods to see which are the, the most effective for now in, in this circumstance uh, and, and see what is most and, and quickly test out and, and try out different things, even if it's very small feedback loops and, and just getting feedback on what is working and what isn't, but not being afraid to find out something isn't working so well this time in the situation and trying something, trying something different. Um, but Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stuart. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you uh, during the Q and A session. But I think the core message has been around uh, being humble regarding what we know, what works, and uh, what could work in a completely novel situation like this. And um, always having that spirit of experimentation, learning from your uh, program participants and users, and applying data and evidence-based approach towards designing finer uh, tuned interventions. So thank you so much for, for that uh, sort of approach to it. Now I'll, I'll move to uh, uh, Shamima Apanau uh, from Unilever. I think Unilever sits at a, at a very interesting position within this whole conversation, a private sector company, but with a very, very high uh, sort of socially responsible mission, uh, which is also part of the business. So it's, it's kind of in a unique position to uh, drive the uh, global discourse around hand hygiene, uh, among a number of other things. So uh, Shaima, I know right now Unilever is running a number of different things, being a core partner of uh, HBCC. And also uh, you have launched a brand new campaign called H4 Handwashing. So we are quite excited to uh, sort of hear bits and pieces about this, but it would be great to hear from you what's the uh, uh, what's the narrative from Unilever's side in binding all these different interventions together? If you may, please, Shami Mapa. Thank you very much, Avi. And I was, you know, solely enjoying the conversation. And every time I join this kind of webinar, I join as a participant, not like as a speaker, because every time I take many learnings from here. And I was also reading all the uh, comments or questions that were coming and you know, it seems like the participants knows a lot. In fact, many cases are not know a lot more than us. So thank you very much for bringing those participants who are giving uh, ideas to us as well. So coming back to your first question, like how, you know, Unilever's position. So let me start with the history saying that, uh, you know, we do, uh, we have a, one of the largest hygiene brand called Lifeboy with us, right? And this brand started its journey in, uh, 1894 and the purpose was to help Victorian England uh, to combat uh, you know cholera so uh, this brand has got you know survived over 125 years and it has seen many this kind of pandemics uh, or like new diseases and everything so as a business of course we understand that you do need to have a right product which actually brings the solution with the right price point. At the same time, the product needs to evolve with the changing scenario. 
So we, of course, when we're looking into the product, what is the best product for the consumers and the people all over the world, we, we also know that the product needs to really talk in a right manner, meaning the behavior change. So whenever you have a product, it's, it can be perfect, but if it is not connecting with the consumer or the general people and encouraging them to understand why, why, why this product will solve, you know, we, is needed and how it is going to solve your problem. So that's how we kind of address these challenges. And, um, you know, in this COVID situation, of course, we knew that hand hygiene is very important. We were the initiator of Global Hand Washing Day. Um, from the very inception, uh, we were working with the global organizations, local organization, organization like BRAC and, uh, you know, smaller organization like, or innovative organization, organization like Happy Jab. So we do have ranges, right? Um, what we realize that as a big organization, uh, Unilever's product get used by 2.5 billion people every day. So our capacity to influence people is a lot and people will want more from us and a responsible behavior from us. So that puts a lot of uh, responsibility into our shoulder and we respect that. And in Bangladesh context, our product you know, reaches to um, nine households out of 10. So our reach is also very massive. Where we found like in this COVID period, like our responsibility even in, you know, increases more saying that uh, before this vaccine comes, this is the one uh, easy solution we have. Meaning if we wash hands with soap and water, it can reduce the ch chance of, uh, you know, catching COVID drastically. Now, um, we were looking into our consumer insight, meaning like uh, we know that if we do a communication today, we e easily get the, uh, uh, you know, nudge from the market saying that, okay, whether people are getting this communication well. And we can then try to change it and make it easily understandable. So behavior change needs to start from this. It needs to be really easy and people needs to understand it. Uh, I remember Mr. Imran was saying that, uh, you know, that germs is a not, you know, we cannot see it. So if we, we cannot see it, believability is very hard, right? That's how the, you know, different sort of communication comes in, how we can make it believable, how, can, how we can make it interesting. So that people don't worry about uh, these things that way, rather get encouragement and think that it is easy. It's not difficult. Um, uh, to combat this virus uh, uh, with hand hygiene, social, uh, you know, physical distancing, wearing the mask and other, you know, good practices. And um, uh, these are very important that it needs to be desirable. I need to go back and wash my hands if I get the opportunity. And uh, the point of like how fast I should be doing it or how often I should be doing it. Hasin Appa was saying that now in behavior change communication, we have to tell that not only after using the toilet or before, uh, you know, eating, we have to also say like, what are the other times we have to wash hands? So um, we, from the very beginning, was knowing that it is coming to Bangladesh from January, for, you know, middle of January, we started communicating this. We started our partnership discussion with organizations like BRAC, WaterAid, or even other organizations, right? Because we know that you will be going to the deep rural where maybe we will take some time through uh, traditional media. And we realized that going home, going school, going community, we have to work with everyone. So that's where we realized that uh, it's not only, uh, you know, marketing the soap, but encouraging people to use the soap for a uh, deadly, you know, to uh, protect against the deadly disease. So that's where we went all ahead because we believe that when a brand, a reputed brand, when a reliable brand talks about it, people tend to believe it. So we have used our brand power, we have used our consumer insight, and we have used our willingness and desire to work with different kinds of partners be it a non-profit organization, be it government, be it a student body, or be it innovative businesses like Happy Tap or Bumijo. 
So we wanted to reach out as many people as possible uh, through all this intervention. At the same time, also wanted to learn from everyone what you just all have discussed, right? And how quickly we can incorporate this and bring better solution uh, in terms of product availability, product design, as well as communication ideas. So these three were our main focus throughout this pandemic. And uh, we got some great result and it's, it's showing that people are using uh, soap uh, higher than before. So it is showing that people, uh, you know, these uh, behavior change communication or like hand hygiene messaging is working and people are, uh, you know, being encouraged to, uh, you know, wash their hands uh, more Excellent. often. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Shaima. Thanks. Thanks for I think delineating Unilever's overall strategy towards engaging a wider group of uh, 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 organizations from different sectors to sort of uh, reach its mission. And uh, I'll, I'll come uh, come to you, uh, come back to you during the Q&A session. But uh, at this point, would would be very interested to hear uh, from uh, Mr. Etashamul Rasul Khan. Uh, representing the government's voice uh, in this conversation. And I think uh, when we're talking about partnership, when we're talking about collaborating across the board, of course, uh, no collaboration would be successful without uh, 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 a specific uh, sort of uh, support from the government side. And uh, I know different organizations, uh, they have been working with government uh, in during COVID-19 and also beyond that in many sectors as well. But uh, so would love to understand your perspective on um, how organizations could work more with government uh, in specific uh, regards to hand hygiene promotion and for other large scale interventions as well. Uh, if you may, please. Uh, Mr. Khan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Obi. Uh, learned panelist and distinguished participant. Actually, behavioral change is not a standalone component. It works as a silo work. In many cases, we see that campaign related to hygiene practice in local level by many NGOs works very good. In the most cases, this campaign work for a specific period as part of the organization project project-driven output. And after some time, uh, it, we, we see that it vanishes in the, in the uh, darkest uh, insensibility. Um, when such campaign design, we need to bridge between silo types of words for the achievement of national target. Mm. As example, in this, this is the October month, and we declared it as sanitation month observation as we observed every year. And do this campaign in collaboration with all relevant sectors partners to implement the campaign. Uh, this, uh, uh, similarly, regarding hand hygiene and behavioral Shift requires such types of action plan and those in all possible media like social media, print media, TVs, community radios, school, etc. So that present and future generation get attention to behavioral shift. On the other hand, as you know, uh, that government is very much committed to reach uh, the reach SDG target by 2030. And we are working together with regional, uh, relevant test organizations. And to, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, and some uh, organization to ensure the SAS SDG goal. Uh, we have reallocated in this time we we uh, recalibrate our sd sdp means sector development plan and redesign our thematic group of sdp 
and one of the thematic group analyzed such hygiene practice and we have already proposed some action plan in the holistic manner to achieve the success in different phases of timeline. Uh, I believe that we, we can work together through uh, reactivating such SDP thematic group in participant all stakeholder we can bring out the success. I would like to mention that also we have already prepared a strategy paper on how we shall respond COVID-19 situation nationwide entailing short term, medium term and long term to achieve the, our goals. Also the national hygiene strategy under the revision aligning SDG target. I strongly believe that uh, integrating SAS recalibrated policy SDP learning from COVID-19 pandemic will, uh, will root our sustainable hygiene practice. Um, if the sector's partners work all together with the government to implement the action plan, I believe that we can mitigate the challenge together in most of the cases, government project emphasize hardware activities. If software support from NGOs, individuals, or industries goes complementary makes holistic approach and to achieve the goals in a sustainable manner. So um, in this way, we can achieve our uh, holistic target uh, as such as. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Khan. And thanks for also pointing out the obvious, uh, the uh, typical length of development projects spanning between three to five years. And then afterwards, it's sometimes, unfortunately, it's difficult to uh, identify what happens to them. So that long term view and uh, towards the sustainability, uh, moving towards the sustainability, I think working with government is imperative. And without that, uh, there would not be a sustainable future for these projects, which are oftentimes bound by funding restrictions um, um, and, and uh, with the project's activity. So thank you, thank you for that. Now, I think we have a, a few minutes uh, for Q and A from the audience. And also, um, I'll, I'll also, I think, throw in a few questions of my own from this very interesting conversation. I'll, I'd like to start with Stuart, uh, actually. Stuart, you mentioned um, about the uh, sort of need for more experimentation, learning from your um, end participants and then creating a feedback loop. Uh, what are some of the things that we're learning from um, across the world uh, that you could that you see could be applied in Bangladesh as well? Or what are some of the um, successful examples uh, uh, from BID's work that could be implemented in Bangladesh as well? Maybe if you want to talk a little about that. Uh, in terms of hand or in terms of hand washing, uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's lots of read across. And I think as part of what I was saying earlier, it's very important to take the theory of you know, what can be effective in, in a specific situation um, combined with those, those learnings uh, um, uh, you know, from, from, from other contexts is really important as well. And there's lots of read across. Uh, I think there's been several suggestions from, 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 from the other participants of those type of mechanisms that we found to be very effective. And I think some of the work that we've been doing in the UK has focused on some of the points that have already been raised. I think a few of those have been, um, one, I think um, Hasinaba mentioned this um, previously, but uh, around uh, critical time. So thinking about, uh, you know, setting a time when it's really important to wash your, ha your hands so that therefore that can become a habit. So is that maybe when you get home or whenever you leave home? So if you can set that up as a critical time, but uh, in your messaging, you try to just get people to think about, okay, as soon as I get home, I'm going to wash my hands. Just before I leave my home, I'm always going to wash my hands. And if you can think about those um, critical times, that's, you're much easier to be able to follow through with your desire in, in terms of washing your hands more often. Uh, and then I think another key point that we've learned from some of our work in the UK and elsewhere, it, it's also been mentioned previously, but it's definitely around messengers. So who 
um, sends the message is extremely important. Uh, and I think this um, is already being kind of utilized within the, the programming at the moment in, in Bangladesh. But wherever possible, can we use those kind of networks that we have through through BRAC programs and field staff and others in order to, to kind of make that personal connection um, to you know trusted friends and advisors in order to, to get those messages across. And I think um, uh, that, that that should be a key component of uh, some of the upcoming uh, programming is making sure that we're using all of those nodes um, where, the, where there are personal connections. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I, would, I would want to um, ask uh, Mr. Mr. Khan in here from the government side. I mean, we are, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of implementing programs in uh, accessible plainland regions, it's, it's easier to uh, run projects in there from uh, either a private sector perspective or NGO perspective. But oftentimes, uh, people living in remote uh, Chor or Hau regions remote regions of the country, they don't get to benefit from these interventions uh, 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 more often than not. So what is the government's thinking regarding uh, developing more inclusive initiatives where people living in the margins uh, in remote geographic regions can also benefit from these projects? Maybe if you could shed some light from the existing strategy uh, that government has developed. Actually, uh, you know that governments have very uh, uh, actually actually government have uh, all, all uh, so far i know maybe all sector have a have a good good strategy in in the government's hand but uh, its implementation and uh, its, its sustainability is questionable actually uh, we have a, a strategy or guideline have a, a fine guideline and in uh, government has uh, uh, have uh, committed no one behind uh, any uh, development so uh, actually our uh, all uh, we we take a holistic approach to uh, go through the left, uh, left people who lives in the chore area or hard to reach area or uh, difficult uh, area, uh, and um, if uh, NG, uh, NGO or uh, others individuals go uh, go there in peaceful basis, but uh, if government uh, if they they, uh, they collaborate with uh, with government strategies, uh, it will be uh, too much uh, helpful. To achieving this, uh, uh, these uh, types of no one uh, actually we go to the uh, people who are left behind. Actually, if uh, we follow the government strategy or uh, guideline to uh, achieve this goal. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it's it's a very powerful statement, uh, which also underpins the sustainable development goals. Leave no one behind. Uh, this principle, uh, I think uh, everyone should adhere to that, starting from the government to private sector players to NGOs who should be working in the collaboration to sort of identify those pockets where, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to reach people just because of geographic uh, remoteness or also people with disabilities, uh, people who are living in the margins of the society who would otherwise be overlooked uh, from mainstream programming. So I think having that lens is really helpful. So thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Khan, and uh, uh, I would I would uh, like to come over to Shamima Apain here. So uh, Unilever has done um, has covered a lot of ground, not just in terms of COVID nineteen, but uh, you have uh, you had I think just completed your decade long Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Um, now uh, we are moving to the next decade, which has also been. Uh, 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 recognized as the decade of action for achieving the sustainable development goals. So a lot is happening. So would want to understand a little about what are the future plans of Unilever uh, do, uh, sort of uh, uh, in regards to hand hygiene and also towards other sustainable uh, living uh, initiatives. If you could shed some light on that, Sharima. Thank you, Abhi. Um, 
as said that Unilever has got a unique characteristics when we say that uh, we plan first and we say like we will figure out a way of doing it. So Liveboy had the mission of like reaching out 2 billion people, right, by, uh, you know, 2025. Of course, we are um, yet to reach that number. We are almost 50%, a long way to go. But um, uh, that is the reason collaboration is very important for us. Uh, working with partners and going to the deep, uh, deepest pocket is very important and we cannot do it ourselves. Um, uh, we have learned because of our USLP last 10 years experience, we have learned one thing very interesting that uh, um, when uh, consumer want us to take the responsibility, uh, also consumer expect us to help them to understand it. But at the same time, consumer uh, centric communication is important. They want brand which has got a record of deliverables. It's not only saying what are we doing and with who we are doing. That is the reason uh, we, we think uh, Unilever is one of the organization works with very many partner organizations and seek guidance from them as well. Uh, now, next 10 years of USLP will be a couple of very important uh, initiative we have to see the packaging, especially plastic uh, footprint, then reducing the water footprint, meaning like, uh, and as well as carbon footprint. These are very important uh, strategy for us. Uh, I have seen in a chat box, someone said that uh, going forward, when someone is going to design the wash program, they should think about how to reduce water usage, right? And uh, think about how business can take a role in it. We are constantly monitoring our current product. If today's product is taking uh, 30 seconds to rinse the soap from the hands, we should make a product that should uh, you know, do the job at the same time is possible to rinse it within 15 minutes, seconds so that we, uh, through our product innovation, we can uh, reduce the water usage. At the same time, also saying that how can we encourage our next generation to take it as a practice, positive practice. That is the reason you have rightly said, Avi, that we launched this Global Hand Washing Day, the innovative campaign called H for Hand Washing. So that uh, the way we learn A, B, C, D, or Shorya Shorya, right? That's why if we can say like hand washing is so important, and if children are learning it from textbook, learning it from teachers and the parents, they will never forget it. And of course, uh, all the panelists have said that behavior change takes time, right? It, it, it requires a quite a bit of practice, repeat, and you know, that's how it becomes habit. So that's where we are really encouraging and um, you know, putting all our efforts, using all our brand ambassadors, using our brand power, uh, working in, uh, closely in hand with uh, uh, organizations as well as you know government and wanting to match up uh, uh, and create a holistic movement so that people take it positively because uh, in this world when um, COVID also has given us the threat of economic downturn that's why people should think about that soap is very essential it's it's not like soap or rice right so it needs to be there this is as of now the uh, safe and easy and cheap product that we do have. Also, we will ensure that uh, more innovation comes in uh, communication wide, product wise, as well as we get more insight from the community, what is working for them. And we want to um, learn and do it together. So that is our holistic approach for USLP. And we are hoping to learn uh, going forward, as Stuart has said, that uh, you know, uh, learning by doing. We will be doing mistakes, but Unilever is a pro company which is always, uh, you know, looking forward to learn more and uh, you know, alter our way forward. Over to you. All right. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. But here's to uh, more H's in the textbooks for hand washing. Um, uh, so I think I think we have come to uh, almost an end to our uh, uh, sort of uh, very informative webinar today. Uh, we, we covered a lot of different grounds. Uh, the panelists brought along uh, with them uh, uh, combined, I think, more than uh, 100 years of experience, uh, if, I, if I count everyone in here today. And we talked a lot about uh, the community-based uh, nature of interventions uh, from BRAC's uh, experience and from Moderate's experience uh, on, on driving uh, sustainable systemic change, because I think there are no alternatives for 
um, these uh, these interventions, these messages that uh, uh, we want to sort of uh, push forward without a strong buy from the community. From research and learning perspective, we uh, talked, we touched upon different uh, uh, aspects, starting from uh, what could be uh, the gender dimension uh, of this, uh, of, of these types of interventions and uh, where organizations should be making their investment. I think a lot of interesting research could happen uh, towards uh, uh, understanding this issue a lot more and also key issues re regarding governance, how resources are being allocated. Uh, we uh, also talked a lot about uh, the, the need for uh, nimble and agile designs uh, for these interventions to continually learning from them and then adapting our approach because uh, I think nowhere it's, it's more important than facing novel uh, sort of public health crisis like COVID-19. It has taught us the uh, humility that we require to sort of accept that we don't know enough and uh, be open towards understanding more from uh, what has been happening on the ground. And also uh, the, the spirit and the need for collaboration across different sectors. Uh, no one single entity can achieve this monumental change uh, alone. And that's where uh, organizations like Unilever come in. The role of government becomes much more, uh, much more uh, effective uh, if a, in, in bringing all parties together. So I think that is also one key aspect that we uh, touched upon today. Um, I wanted to thank all our speakers who uh, sort of made time out of their busy schedule and uh, came in here today to sort of uh, help us guide our overall learning uh, towards this very important uh, uh, issue of hand hygiene and hand washing in general. I wanted to thank all the participants who have tuned in from uh, different parts of the world and uh, who have stayed with us. Uh, we would be uh, hopefully sharing a summary of the conversations, uh, conversation in here today in celebration of the Global Hand Washing Day. And I wanted to thank our partners in FCDO and Unilever uh, who are supporting this initiative uh, through the Hygiene and Behavior Change Coalition. So thank you, thank you again. And uh, hopefully we get to meet everyone in person this time around next year. Uh, in a slightly better uh, environment. And until then, uh, keep washing your hands. Uh, that's always good, uh, with or without COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. With thank that you, everyone. Concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much.